in keeping with our standard operating procedure the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer giving each of you the opportunity to name your sins to god if we name our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing when we name our sins to god we are filled with god the holy spirit therefore with your heads bowed and your eyes closed let us pray Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Matthew 4, 12. Now when Jesus heard that John the baptizer had been taken into custody, he went into Galilee. Now, now that uh, John's ministry had been fulfilled uh, and that his, the prophecy of John's ministry had been fulfilled by preparing the way of salvation, by teaching the way of salvation, and by teaching a rebound after salvation, it is now time for the ministry of Christ to begin. And the ministry of Christ began when he was about 30 years old. And then in 4.13, while in Galilee, he moved from Nazareth, that is, Jesus did, moved from Nazareth to make his home in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet would be fulfilled. Now, Matthew brings this out because he wants to make it very clear that all Old Testament prophecies have been fulfilled concerning the Messiah because when the Jews look for the Messiah, uh, they rely on prophecy. What will occur? What will be the signs that the uh, Messiah has arrived? Well, this was one of them, and Matthew wants to make it very clear. So this was so that the Jews could clearly understand that Jesus Christ is the Messiah because he did, in fact, fulfill all Old Testament prophecy concerning his coming. Now, in 4.15, we have the prophecy taken from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. Most of it's taken from verse 2. Isaiah 9, 1 through 2. For, and this is uh, given to us in Matthew chapter 4, 15. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way by the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sit in darkness. Now this refers to reversionists. Those are those people who are negative toward the Word of God. They are believers, but they're negative toward the Word of God and have negative volition. They care not for the Word of God. So they're sitting in darkness outside of fellowship. The people who sit in darkness have seen a great light. The great light is, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. And on those sitting in the region of the shadow of death, they're sitting in the region, the land of the shadow of death, because they are about to go under the fifth cycle of discipline. And what's the fifth cycle of discipline? That's when God destroys a country because of their negative volition to the Word of God. So because of their negative volition to the Word of God, they're about to go under the fifth cycle of discipline, so they reside in a region that is under or called the region of the shadow of death because death is very nigh to them and the destruction of their country is very nigh. But it, then it goes on to say, And on those sitting in the region of the shadow of death, a light has dawned, and this light is the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they're under the fourth cycle of discipline, and now a light has dawned, and now they have a choice to either believe the message of Christ or to reject it. And we know they re most of them reject it because the fifth cycle of discipline does come. Now in 4.17, from that time Jesus began to preach this message. So he picks up where John the baptizer left off, teaching the coming of the kingdom. And so what he says is, your Bible says repent. We know repent means metanoieo, M-E-T-A-N-O-E-O, -E -E meaning change your mind. And Christ is taking up the same message of John the baptizer. Change your mind about me. You see, metanoieo has a subject and an object in the Greek. 
the subject the unbeliever, and the unbeliever must change their mind about Christ and believe in him. As a result of changing your mind, you believe in Christ. Change your mind, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is referring to the millennium. And Jesus Christ says, look, just change your mind about me. Believe in me. The kingdom of heaven is near. The same message that John the baptizer had. He's picking up on that message to, uh, to complete the ministry, as it were, because John the baptizer, excuse me, John the baptizer started the ministry as a way of laying the foundation. <coughs> excuse me, so the subject of metanoieo, the subject is un unregenerate mankind, that is mankind that has not believed in Christ. The object, Jesus Christ, they must have a change of mind about Christ. Most of the Jews did not change their mind about Christ, so the millennium, which he was preaching, saying the kingdom of heaven is near, meaning the millennium, the dispensation of the millennium is near. Change your mind about me. But they didn't do so, and because they did not change their mind about Christ, the millennium has been postponed and inserted into uh, this, into the age of Israel. Well, there was the age of Israel, and then the hypostatic union is when our Lord came to the earth as the true God-man. And then he, he preached to them the uh, gospel of the kingdom. Believe in me, the kingdom is near. But they didn't believe in him, so the kingdom has been put off until a later date. And inserted in between that time and the kingdom is this age, the church age. Yet all of these things are still hidden because we're dealing with Matthew who is addressing the Jews and anything concerning the church is hidden. There was no church during the time of Matthew's writing. There was no church during the time Jesus Christ was on the earth. There were synagogues, and there were the Jews there who believed in the Mosaic law, but there was no church age. That would come later. So a light has dawned, meaning the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then our Lord Jesus Christ picks up the ministry where John left off and talks about how the millennium is drawing near. 4.18, as he was walking by the Sea of Galilee... He saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Peter is one of my favorite uh, persons in the Bible, not because he was uh, so great, but because he was so graced out. And Peter, starting out, the apostle Peter later on, uh, was really an ignoramus concerning scripture. Well, all of us are when we start out. But then we learn these things, and we are not so much of an ignoramus anymore. And so Peter starts out as an ignoramus, but uh, Jesus Christ, along with God the Father, shows him a lot of grace. So we have Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. He said to them, follow me and I will turn you into fishers of men. Now they, they now are going to be fishers of men and they will be fishers of men. So instead of casting the net into the sea, they're going to cast the net of the gospel of Christ and see who is positive and who will say, yes, I believe your message. So when they get up and preach, as it were, and say, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, they will be casting a net out. And then those fish that they catch will be those men who, and women who say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Savior. So, of course, this is a higher calling than being a fisher of fish. A fisher of men is a much higher calling than just being a regular fisherman. And back then, a fisherman wasn't looked down on. It was actually a pretty good profession because uh, that was how many people were provided food in those days. Food is much more prevalent today, and uh, if you're a fisherman today, it's not looked at as highly as it was in those days. So he said, follow me and I will turn you into fishers of men. Then in 420, they left their nets immediately. That means they didn't even think about it. They left their nets immediately and followed him. Well, they didn't even worry about their possessions. They didn't even go home and uh, get some of the clothes they may have wanted. They just said, all right, we'll follow you. And immediately they followed Jesus Christ. So they left their nets immediately, which means they had an immediate response to Christ. And they left without worry of their belongings. 
and they simply moved when they were asked to move. So this showed their obedience to the plan of God. It was God's plan for them to follow Christ. And since uh, they were humble enough, they simply said, all right, we're, we will follow you and didn't even have any worry about it. Didn't worry about uh, where they would receive their next paycheck because as a fisherman, they got paid for their work. As a fisher of men, well, there's no guarantee they would be paid for that, yet they left anyway, left their jobs and went and followed the Lord. So they left their nets immediately, and that's a point to be noted. Then in 421, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. Then Jesus called them. They immediately left their boat and their father. They left not only the boat, but they left their father. And usually in those days, what you would do is if your father was a fisherman, you too would be a fisherman. If your father was a carpenter, you too would be a carpenter. That was part of the culture. But they left it immediately. Not only left their profession, but left their family, left the father. Left the father who is Zebedee. And they immediately left him. So the other disciples, these are uh, four of them, the other disciples are mentioned in chapter 10 of Matthew. Now these disciples left everything, including their family. And this indicates the importance of having positive volition over family and over peer pressure and those things that would influence us not to go in that way. And oftentimes... Uh, family ties and peer pressure become a source of testing in our lives. Now sometimes, and if you are born into a Jewish family today, and you believe in Christ, and they are an, uh, zealous, uh, re they are zealously religious in their Judaism, they will disown you. If you believe in Christ and you are in a Jewish family who is very zealous concerning Judaism and you say, uh, hey, I have believed in Christ, they will disown you. They'll kick you out of the family. So it becomes important to know that they just left their father. And they loved their father, but they left their father knowing that they had a higher calling and that when we go to heaven, we will recognize our family members if they're there with us. Uh, but uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the meaning that it does here on earth. And this is where we uh, come to Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, and I would like you to turn there because it's an important point. And this was a decision that uh, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, had to uh, come to, uh, well, deal with. They had to deal with this issue. Would they leave their father? Would they leave their family? Would they just all of a sudden get up and leave the business and immediately follow Jesus Christ? And so in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, it says this, Do not presume that I, this is Jesus Christ, do not presume that I, Jesus Christ, have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Now this is important. Because what is this sword referring to? The sword is referring to the cross. The cross is the basis for spiritual warfare. Remember from Matthew chapter 4 how Satan was trying so desperately to get Christ from going to the cross. So this is a point of spiritual warfare. And it divides the human race. Jesus Christ, actually your attitude toward Jesus Christ becomes a division in the human race. Some people will believe in Christ. Some people will not. Some people will believe in Christ and then hate the word of God. Some people will believe in Christ and love the word of God. So it becomes a point of division within families. The source of our salvation is the basis of war. Uh, the, the war of all ages, the angelic conflict, um, conflict until Christ returns in the millennium. Therefore, in the church age and in the tribulation which will follow the church age, Christ is a divider of people depending on their attitude toward Christ. 
Now, you might have a family in which everyone's believed in Christ and everyone loves the Word of God. And that would be an optimum situation to be in because there will be no division. But if you're born into a family where some have believed in Christ and some have not, there's going to be division that arises. And this is what Matthew 10:34 tells us. The division, therefore, reaches the closest relationships in life, including the relationship of family. And you say, why does this occur? Uh, why is Jesus Christ all of a sudden being tough and saying, look, I'm a sword. I am going to divide families. And he goes on to explain this in more detail, which we will go over. But I wrote this a little early, earlier today, and it has to do with the great divide. And the great divide is on the board up there. This thing doesn't want to stay up, but oh well. So we have the great, well, it can't be that low. It has the great, or oh, I'll just hold it. Maybe there's a thing I can tighten this up. There's not? Well, that's ridiculous. Okay, the great divide. On the one hand, we have the cosmic system. And the cosmic system includes a certain category of people. And then on the other hand, we have the spiritual life. And then there's a slash that says DE, which means divine establishment. Now, under cosmic system, uh, point one, that's a point one over there, it's the unbeliever who has rejected Christ. In, cosmic, in the cosmic system, the unbeliever can reject Christ. Now, that means they were an unbeliever, and then they heard the gospel, and they still rejected it. So they fall into the cosmic system because they rejected the water of the word, the gospel. And then the second category of people who live in the cosmic system is the believer, that, that person who has believed in Christ, who neglects the word of God, Bible doctrine, and they are involved in what is called cosmic one. Cosmic is a Satan system. The cosmic system is Satan's system, and for the believer who simply neglects the Word of God, they are in cosmic one. That doesn't mean they hate the Word of God. That doesn't mean that they will, uh, if, for example, you listen to the Word of God and they don't, that doesn't mean that they will jump all over you for listening to the Word of God, simply because they've neglected it. Not that they reject it, they just don't have time for it, they think. And then the third point is the believer who rejects the Word of God, and when you reject it, you're in cosmic too. And that means you actually come to hate people who are living the spiritual life. And then under the second half of the great divide, on the first side, it's people in the cosmic system. On the second side, it's people who live their spiritual life. That's for the believer. But the unbeliever too can accept divine establishment, which means they can be patriotic. They can love their country, love their family, and follow the system God has set up for them. And they live a happy life until they die and go to hell. So for the unbeliever, they can function under divine establishment. So they will be divided against the unbeliever who does not live under divine establishment. The unbeliever who does not live under divine establishment uh, falls under such systems as uh, communism, socialism, liberalism, all of those things. So they'll be a socialist, yet the unbeliever functioning under divine establishment will be a capitalist. So they naturally have a, a thing in which they are against each other. Because what happens, the unbeliever under divine establishment says, I will follow God's establishment. And God has set up an establishment. Family, volition of course, then family, marriage, all of that. So they follow those principles. And they get married to a wife and never cheat on her. And they have a wonderful life together and he loves his job. And this is an unbeliever who has never received the gospel. But what happens is if an unbeliever is living here and then they receive the gospel and they say, I reject Christ, they will immediately move into the cosmic system. And then uh, when they do that, they completely change as people. At, at first under divine establishment, they may have been wonderful people, but then they reject Christ, and then suddenly they fall under communism, socialism, liberalism. They uh, reject the authority of their president, their country, all of those things, and they become highly hostile toward anyone who even says they're a Christian. 
This is part of the cosmic system for the unbeliever. But it's a great divide, and of this unbeliever part is, uh, well, it's one of those things that uh, we really don't have to deal with much as believers. But as believers, well, we have uh, believers in Christ who utilize their spiritual life on this side. And on the other side, we have the believer who, next, who neglects Bible doctrine. They don't care for it. And they don't have time for the Word of God, yet these people make it number one priority. So a great divide begins because uh, these people don't understand what you're doing. They don't have a clue. Why, does, why are you going to church every day? What, what is the point of you going to church? You say, because I'm learning the Word of God, the most important thing. But they're neglecting it. They don't have a clue why you're doing it. And so a, a conflict, a natural conflict begins. Now, this conflict here isn't so bad, but it worsens when you get down here because this is the believer who rejects the Word of God or Bible doctrine, and they move into cosmic too. They're not just neglecting it because they're too busy, but they actually reject what they hear and say, oh, that's a bunch of hogwash. And then uh, while you're over here living under the power sphere, living under the filling of God the Holy Spirit, and this DD here, has to do with the divine dinosphere. And you're living inside uh, God's uh, power experiment. You are living inside the unique spiritual life. And for the other side, uh, they don't understand you because they reject the word of God. They got their toes stepped on. They, I didn't like what he said. It offended me. But then over here they say, but it's the word of God. It's in scripture. I must believe it. So a natural conflict arises. And it can arise among family members. And this is what Jesus Christ is trying to let us know. That, hey, you're going to have to make a choice in life. You're going to come under pressure. And people, maybe even in your own family, will say, you don't need to be doing that. That's ridiculous. Sounds like a cult to me every day. What's that? Uh, you don't need to go there. And so what they will do is get in conflict with you. And then you will say, it's not a cult. I can leave any time I want or stay. Nobody will say anything to me if I leave or go. Leave or stay. It doesn't really matter. But they won't believe it because they've rejected the word. And the, a conflict will arise. And it's a natural conflict that our Lord talks about in Matthew. All part of scripture. So in Matthew 10.35, he, uh, well, he goes into a, uh, actually a type of tirade in which he gives examples of how he is a divider in families. For I have come to set a man against his father. Well, just think if your father is a Jew, and uh, uh, or let's say he's Muslim. Let's say your father is uh, a Muslim, a zealot Muslim, and he wants to follow the Koran exactly the way the Koran was written. But you, on the other hand, want to follow Jesus Christ. That's going to set you apart from your father. Most definitely. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. This means that uh, Jesus Christ, uh, because of your attitude toward Christ and because of their attitude toward, toward Christ, there will be a natural development of enemyship even within your own family and then in 1037 whoever loves that's the greek word phileo p-h-i-l-e-o p-h-i-l-e-o and this is phileo and phileo always refers to personal love and we all have a personal love for our father all of us, it's natural, and I'm not saying this so that you run home and say, I hate, I hate you because of this. No, <laughs> that's ridiculous. We all love our parents, our mother, and our father, uh, but what it's saying here is whoever loves, phileo, personal love, whoever loves father or mother more than me. Now, there's an emphasis here. Now, it doesn't mean you do not love your father and mother. Of course, you love your father and mother. It would be stupid on your part not to. But what it says is, whoever loves mother or father more than me. Not if you love them, but if you love them more than Christ. So what this brings out is something that I've taught many, many times. 
and that is that there is a people emphasis in your life rather than a God emphasis. And this is a huge problem in Christianity today. Your love in relationships becomes more important than your personal relationship with Christ. And to move this away from the family a little bit, and let's say uh, you meet a girlfriend and you get to know her and date her and there's nothing wrong with dating. That's how you get to know people. And so you take her to the movies and you watch uh, movies with her at your house and you talk to her and you get to know her. And if you realize she's an unbeliever, well, there's a natural conflict that's going to arise because you're a believer. You've believed in Christ. Your girlfriend hasn't. So in that case, you're going to have to make a choice. Are you going to stick with this girl who cares not for Christ? Or are you going to follow Christ and, and do what Scripture says and we are not to marry an unbeliever? So we and why date an unbeliever if you're not planning to marry the unbeliever? Because when you're dating, actually what you're doing is you're, well, you're playing to the field to see who uh, lines up with your integrity. And if you date someone who doesn't line up with your integrity and you find out, you just say, hey, it's not going to work out. I need to, uh, God will send me someone else. And then you date that someone else and you find out, hey, their integrity lines up with mine. They believe in Christ and they love the word of God just like I do. So I'll go with this person. And it's a matter of discernment on your part. So there is people emphasis in your life rather than God emphasis. That is, if you love your father and mother more than Christ. It's not saying don't love them. It's saying don't love them more than Christ. So love in relationships for many believers becomes more important than your personal, personal relationship with Christ. And how do you have this wonderful personal relationship with Christ? By living your unique spiritual life. Then, uh, once again, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy. Now, this is not an indication of loss of salvation, but it is an indication of reversionism. It means you're not living your protocol spiritual life as our Lord lived the prototype. That means the spiritual life is not number one in your life. Instead, your relationship with people is number one. And if someone distracts you from the word of God, Let's say you have a best friend and uh, you say, hey, I'm going to go to Bible class tonight. And your best friend says, oh, come on, man, let's go to the mall and uh, pick up some ladies. Well, you have a, well, you've reached an issue here. You've reached a test. Are you going to say, all right, I'll go to the mall with you and look at ladies? Or are you going to say, I, I, no, I, I love uh, the Lord Jesus Christ more than that. I'm going to make the choice to go to class. I'll go to the mall with you after Bible class or after my daily Bible study, however you do it, whether it be face-to-face -face or MP3 or Internet, however you're getting it, and you say, no, I got this to do first, then I'll go with you and be entertained with you. And uh, this is not an indication of your salvation when it says you're not worthy. It, it, none of us are really worthy of Christ. What it's saying is that uh, uh, you haven't put the Lord Jesus Christ as number one priority in your life. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross. What's this mean? Well, this is actually dealing with something uh, totally different than what you think. Because uh, just think about it for a moment. We cannot take up the same cross our Lord took up. We are not qualified to do so. The only person who could bear the sins of the world on the cross was our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're not qualified to take up that same cross. But it is an idiom, and what it refers to is you living your spiritual life. And when you live the same spiritual life our Lord lived, which is easy, then you are taking up your cross. You are uh, living the spiritual life just as Christ did. So that means in this case, where it says, and whoever does not take up his cross, it means maximum use of number seven and number eight on the flat line, which is personal love for God the Father, which is your motivational virtue, and impersonal love for all mankind. That is your functional Virtue. What's the difference? What is virtue? Well, when you have a personal love for God the Father, there's virtue in that because God the Father is perfect. 
and we can have a perfect relationship with God the Father. And then under functional virtue, you have impersonal love for mankind, which means uh, you love others as you love yourself. You're functioning under spiritual self-esteem. So following Christ is to use the two power options, the filling of God the Holy Spirit, and metabolization of the Word of God. You're doing the same thing Christ did. You pick up the cross, you're doing the same thing Christ did on the earth. That's all it means. So, and whoever does not take up his cross, whoever does not live his spiritual life, and follow me, when you live the spiritual life, you're following Christ. And that way, when you're living the spiritual life, you can say, what would Jesus do? And you would know what he would do. You would know that he would use the word of God just as we learn the word of God. You know that Jesus Christ grew in grace and in knowledge just as we do. So taking up the cross simply means that we live the same spiritual life Christ did. He lived the prototype. We live the protocol. Then in 1039, whoever discovers his soul, this is actually a reference to personal love. Uh, you see, what it's saying is you've discovered your soul, and your soul has a personal love for your parents, of course. And what it's saying is, but your personal love for your parents, or your personal love for uh, your wife, your personal love for anyone in your family, has become greater than your personal love for Christ. Now, I don't want you to get confused, and I don't want you to think to yourself, well, I must love Christ and not love anyone else. That's ridiculous. That's stupid. You, you can have a personal love for Christ and still love your parents and your family members and your friends, and you should. It's not saying you should not. What it's saying is you love them, and then they might not uh, like what you're doing. They might not like you listening to the word of God. They might not like you uh, uh, following in Christ's footsteps because there's a natural division as is being brought out here. But you still love them and you don't argue with them. The worst thing you could ever do is say, you're wrong, I'm right. Well, they're not going to believe you anyway. And so what you do is uh, just, uh, and if, they, and if uh, you are in a position in which somebody says, and they are in authority over you, such as a husband over a wife. And there's been many cases where a husband has been in authority over their wife. And the husband has said, I don't want you listening to that guy anymore. He bothers me. So what the wife would do is stop going to the church and obey the husband. But then when he was fast asleep in bed, she would get out her tape player or her MP3 player. And so as to not bother her husband, listen on her own. And when she had free time or when he was at work and she didn't have to work, she would listen to the word of God. Well, this indicates love for God greater than love for husband. But she still loved her husband, stayed with him, even though he's a jerk. But she stayed with him and said, all right, I'll do as you say. And then there's no issue anymore because they do it in secret. So if you ever get in a situation in which you are under authority and they say, don't listen to that anymore, well, there's ways you can, well, you must uh, follow in Christ's footsteps. So God will provide ways in which you can listen to the word of God and not offend uh, those in your periphery who are in authority. And then when you uh, get old enough and get out of the house, you can make your own choices and, and not worry about it. But you can see the divisions that arise, and they definitely do. And they've arised in my family, not my immediate family, but there are people in my family who just do not care for the word of God. And they're legalists. And they always nitpick and judge other people. And so, well, I still communicate with them. They're part of my family. I still love them as part of my family. But I love Christ more. In other words, I'm not going to do what they say. And they tell me, you shouldn't listen to that guy. He's way off. And I say, no, this is the word of God, I'm going to listen. And they don't influence me in that way. So you must learn to separate yourself mentally. You don't have to do it physically. And you don't have to say, I leave you because, and I'm never going to talk to you again because you don't uh, think the way I think. Well, nobody in the world ever is going to think the way you think. And so what you should do is just simply go on your own way. Do it on your own. Listen on your own. And, and make your own choices with regard to what you believe in life. 
and just uh, like uh, I'm not going to tell you how to believe. I'm going to teach you what Scripture says, but if you say, Pastor, I don't believe what you just said, I'm not going to shove it down your throat and say, you better. No, that's your choice. And I say, well, that's your choice. You Don't come back if you don't like it. And that is the way people should live. But they don't under this concept because when they're in the cosmic system, they want to tell you what to believe. Now, I preach to you what Scripture says, but I'm not telling you to believe what I say. That's your choice. I'm not going to. If you suddenly go away from church for about a year, I'm not going to say, wonder what happened to so-and-so and walk down to your house and say, hey, buddy, you ain't been to church. What's wrong with you? It's none of my business. But see, in the cosmic system, they make it their business. And they will say, what are you doing going there? You need to go to this church where the pastor is friendlier or where you will have a social life. And so they will tempt you in this way. And the cosmic system will bear down on here and try to suck you into it. A lot of times it's successful. A lot of times people start getting with the Word of God and they hear so much slander and they hear so much... Uh, negativism about what they've been learning that they finally start to believe the cosmic system and so they go into the cosmic system but when you're functioning under the spiritual life uh, you you won't function that way you won't run up to people in the cosmic system and say hey get your butt to church you need it no when you're functioning under spirituality you don't say that you say I'm living my spiritual life if if you want it you'll come get it and it's your choice but here's the great divide, and it is a divide, a huge divide, and it causes many, many problems. And this is what they faced when Jesus said, Come, follow me. Well, they had to leave their father and leave their business, leave everything and just follow Christ. Now, remember, this is a different dispensation in which, it, well, it would be as if the Lord were to come down today in all of his glory. He wasn't glorified then, but today he would be. And he were to come down and say, Hey, uh, Dallas, Follow me to the Zippy Mart. Well, uh, no, my husband doesn't want me to. Would you say that or would you say, Okay, Lord, I follow you to the Zippy Mart. Now, that's a ridiculous type of uh, explanation of it, but, uh, well, you would have to make a choice. Follow the Lord to the Zippy Mart or listen to your husband say, uh, No, don't follow the Lord. Well, we would both be going to the Zippy Mart. <laughs> that's the way it would go in, in having your love for Jesus Christ. So again, it says, whoever discovers his soul, that means there's a love for uh, his family member, a personal love, discovered that his soul loves someone, will be deprived of it. And that deals with the fact that loved ones don't stick around forever. Jesus Christ does. Loved ones die and go on to be with the Lord or wherever they're uh, supposed to be as per their faith alone in Christ alone. And that's where they go. And you'll be deprived of it and someone will die eventually in your life. And whoever, whoever gives up his life, that means you give up your life by taking up the cross. And how do you take up the cross? Live the spiritual life. So when you live the spiritual life, you're actually depriving yourself of your own life. You actually become a slave to Jesus Christ. And you're not living on your own, meaning that you're not just uh, every time the old sin nature comes up, as it does when you're an unbeliever, you just don't follow it everywhere. Well, you, ha you are following Christ, and you are a slave to Christ. So whoever discovers his soul will de be deprived of it, and whoever gives up his life by picking up their cross and living the unique spiritual life, for me, will find it. And of course, this doesn't have to deal with self-sacrifice. And you don't have to sacrifice those things that you love, thinking that this is how you will gain God's attention. It doesn't mean that ta taking up your cross is not legalistic. It is not asceticism. What is asceticism? It means self-torture. You try to torture yourself. You say, I will, uh, I will never again uh, say the word damn ever again in my lifetime as part of self-sacrifice. That's not what it means. And it's not that type of thing. It's not giving up something. It is actually taking up something. And when you take up the cross, you are taking up a spiritual life. And you're living your unique spiritual life. So what it's saying is, live your spiritual life. Make sure that's number one. 
Make sure your relationship with people is number two and your relationship with God is number one. And that's what Jesus Christ is saying. Then in 1040, whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who has sent me. Whoever receives you is a reference to people receiving the message of the gospel from the disciples. You see, the disciples would go out and give the gospel of Christ. So whoever receives you, that is their message of the gospel, receives Christ. And whoever receives Christ by receiving the message of the gospel receives God the Father who sent him. And that's all that means right there. It's fairly simple. You receive the gospel of Christ from the disciples, which means you've believed in Christ. And when you believe in Christ, you receive Christ. And then when you believe in Christ, you receive God the Father, the one who sent Christ. So all of that has to do simply with the gospel message and how that uh, the only way you can have a fellowship with God the Father, the only way to have a relationship with God the Father is to believe in Jesus Christ the Son. That's all that it is saying. 1041, whoever receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. What do prophets do or what did prophets do in the Old Testament? They taught the word of God like the prophet Isaiah or the prophet Jeremiah or even David. They taught the word of God. And so, when you receive a prophet, you are receiving the message of the one communicating the word of God. You're receiving the message of the prophet. And that means reward for the hearer. So if you listen to the word of God, and then, and you're listening to it from a prophet, you will receive the reward. The reward of a prophet. Because they've learned the word of God and are communicating it to you. You learn the word of God, and that becomes part of your reward. Who receives a prophet in the name of a, whoever receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. That means whoever receives the message of the prophet will receive a prophet's reward because they get the same message. Whoever receives a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Now, whoever receives a righteous person, when do we receive a righteous person? When we believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was righteousness, never was unrighteous. So when we receive a righteous person, what we are doing is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are just doing just as Abraham did. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was credited to his account for righteousness. When we believe in the Lord, it is credited to our account for righteousness. So, so, whoever receives a righteous person, Jesus Christ, in the name of a righteous person, you see, uh, who gives the gospel? Is it the unrighteous? No, it's the righteous. And why are they righteous? Are they righteous because of who and what they are? No. I give you the gospel of Christ as a righteous person. Why am I righteous? Because I believed in Christ. Why are you righteous? Because you have believed in Christ. So what this is saying is that a righteous person, me, or anyone else who gives you the gospel, they're righteous not because of their righteousness, but because they believed in Christ. And then you believe in Christ, you too become righteous. And so the righteous person is Jesus Christ. So just as when we believe in Christ, we receive the reward, righteous person's reward. The reward, the reward is to possess God's righteousness. When we believe in Christ, all righteousness is imputed to us and we receive the actual righteousness of God. Not because we were so good, but because Christ was so good. And that's why we receive righteousness in grace. That's what that verse means. Chapter 10, verse 42. And whoever gives only a cup of water, cold water, to one of these little ones. These little ones refers to the disciples. Christ calls them little ones because, well, they follow in his footsteps. Also because they're not spiritually mature as of yet. And whoever gives only a cup of water to one of these little ones. They're like uh, chips off the old block, as it were. 
Jesus Christ is the block. They're a chip off the block. The little ones, the disciples, in the name of a disciple, I tell you the truth, he will not lose his reward. What's that mean? Well, giving a cup of cold water to the disciples would indicate positive volition. Well, why would people treat the, the disciples so kindly as to give them a cup of cold water? Because they enjoyed their message. They responded to the message of the gospel. They responded to listening to them. Therefore, due to the positive volition of those listening to the disciples, and they, uh, as a result, in their function, they give them a cold cup of water, they will receive their reward. So the motivation behind giving the disciples a cold cup of water is because of their love for the message. And when the disciples would walk into a city, especially later when they became apostles, following in Jesus Christ's footsteps, when they would follow in Christ's footsteps and come into a city and give the gospel message, uh, some people might be so kind as to give them a cold cup of water. Why? Because they enjoyed the message, because they were positive toward the message. So as a result of their positive volition, they treated the disciples kindly. So that is a result, and their reward is they accepted the message of the disciples. That's their reward. 4.23, Matthew chapter 4.23. Jesus went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The good news, that's what the gospel means, by the way. If you've ever wondered, what's gospel mean? It means good news. The good news of the kingdom was that their Messiah had arrived. Now, he's preaching to them. Remember, this is Matthew. And remember, Christ is preaching to them just as if they're about to go into the millennium. He's preaching to them just as if the millennium is about to arrive. So if they were to have responded positively to our Lord's message, actually the millennium would have arrived. But they rejected it. But this was part of grace provision. Christ knew they would reject his message. He knew in eternity past they would reject his message. But as part of grace provision, he had to give it, get, let them have a hearing. He had to say, hey, I am the Son of God. Believe in me and you'll be saved. And he had to tell all of them the good news of the kingdom, that the kingdom is at hand, that you can have the millennium right now. It's about to happen. I'm here. Your King of kings and Lord of lords, I am here. It's time for you to believe in me. And he had to give them that message. But they did not respond to that message. They rejected that message. But this is part of grace provision. Because God will not uh, destroy a country and will not punish a person until that person has had a hearing. And so everyone who is an unbeliever has the possibility to receive a hearing of the gospel. The only thing they have to do is say, a God, how do I know you? And then God will send them the gospel. And you say, what about those countries in Africa where people uh, never, like the people who uh, speak the click language, uh, what if uh, they want to hear the gospel and uh, nobody's available to give it to them? Well, the reason why they're not receiving the gospel is because they, well, they never want it. Uh, they say to themselves when they get to God consciousness, uh, which occurs usually for the people of the United States at about age six or seven, but for the Africans it might take till age 12 or 13. And when they get to God consciousness, look at the stars and say, why am I here? What is this all about? Then God, and then they realize there must be a God. Then they say, I want to know God. And when they say, I want to know God, then God is obligated in his fairness. Remember, God is always fair. And we really shouldn't question uh, these things, but we do in our humanity. And, uh, but God is fair. And if someone in Africa, speaking the click language, were to wake up today and say, you know what? God exists. I want God to reveal himself to me. Guess what? They would receive the gospel. And somehow and in some way, God would have provided an eternity past for someone to learn the click language, even for just one person, and to go over there and give them the gospel. Or otherwise, 
if uh, evangelism and missionary activity is failing in the client nation, well, God might just say, all right, uh, uh, you're going to the United States. And somehow they end up over here. And then uh, he says, all right, you're going to go to this church and hear the gospel and believe in Christ. And well, he doesn't tell them they will. They just do because they want to believe in Christ. And so the information is provided to them. So 423, he was teaching the gospel of the kingdom and giving the message even though he knew it would be rejected. But he gave the message anyway to make sure that everyone had a hearing before judgment would, become, would come. And so before judgment comes to this country, a hearing is allowed. That means uh, people today could walk in off the street and hear the gospel of Christ and hear the word of God. And they could choose to listen to the gospel and believe and choose to hear the word of God and accept it. Or, uh, if they don't care for it, they won't walk in here. And so this is referring to the fact that he had to give the message even though they would reject him. Then it goes on and says, And healing all kinds of diseases and sicknesses among the people. The reason why this occurred from the power of God the Holy Spirit is so that people would focus their attention on the Lord and his message. Uh, just imagine if uh, you knew somebody close to you who was a paralytic, meaning they could not walk. They're stuck in a wheelchair, like the guy we see going up and down 24 every now and then. Stuck in a wheelchair. And let's say Jesus Christ came down and said, uh, you're healed. And then that person got up and started walking around just as you and I do. Or starts running just as you and I can run. Well, that would bring attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you would say, wow. Look what he just did. He must be the Messiah. And so that is how attention-was brought to Christ and to his message. Then in 424, so a report about him spread throughout Syria. Now this is important because Syria is filled with Gentiles, not Jews. Yet Matthew was written to the Jews, and Christ at this time, his ministry is focused on the Jews. Because Christ at first would have to make it available to the Jews uh, because he's saying the kingdom is about to come. Believe in me. But the Jews rejected it. Yet there are Gentiles who want to hear it. People from Syria are coming down into Israel to hear Jesus Christ. The Gentiles coming to hear Christ. And this is a foreshadowing of the fact that uh, now uh, it's the age of the Gentiles. And now it is mostly Gentiles who have believed in Christ. At that time, it was mostly Jews. But since they had gone negative and said, I do not believe all of this, then it starts to go to the Gentiles. So people from Syria, even Arabs, all started to come to listen to the message of Jesus. So although at this moment, moment Jesus Christ is ministering to the Jews, Gentiles too become receptive to the gospel of Christ. Then it goes on. People brought to him all who suffered with various illnesses and afflictions, those possessed by demons, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And some of those people had been uh, possessed by demons for quite a while, and Jesus Christ would simply cast out the demon, and he would cure epilepsy. And today, even today, epilepsy is, well, it's not curable. It, it can be uh, well, it can be uh, limited in its function. You can take certain medicines that keep you from having seizures. You see, epileptics have seizures quite often. But there is certain medicine today that uh, keeps that connection in the brain going so that you won't have a seizure quite as often, although you'll still probably have one once in a blue moon. But even with medicine, that can't be cured. But with Jesus Christ, he would just cure an epileptic or a paralytic, a, a crippled person. He would heal them. And then in chapter 4, verse 25, And, and that is because of the great miracles, and great crowds followed him from Galilee. They kept following Jesus because they had seen all of these miracles, and they were listening to his message. And for a lot of people, it well, it made them very curious. A lot of them may have never believed in Christ, but many of them became very curious, as anyone would be, seeing all of this healing going on. So the great crowds followed him from Galilee. 
and this would be uh, the Decapolis. That would be Greeks. Even the Greeks were following Christ now. More Gentiles. And then there were uh, people from Jerusalem. They had a lot of different races in Jerusalem, mainly Jews. And then Jews from Judea. And then Arabs from beyond the Jordan River. Now, when you get, why do I say Arabs? Because when you go beyond the Jordan River, that's where the Arabs resided. So there were Arabs coming to see Christ, Greeks coming to see Christ, and Jews as well. So this was uh, starting to indicate, uh, kind of like a foreshadow, that uh, even though right now Christ is only teaching to the Jew, that uh, his message was being received by Gentiles, which was something else because... Well, uh, before that time, Gentiles really weren't concerned with the gospel of Christ. Now, all of a sudden, their interest is piqued, and they want to learn all of these things. And so, this is actually a condemnation on Israel, because they were the client nation. They were the ones who should have been interested in the Lord's message. And he was gearing his message toward them, toward the Jews and uh, telling them, hey, you can believe in me, and the kingdom will come, and your nation will reign for 1,000 years with me as your king. But they rejected all of that. But the Gentiles didn't, and a lot of Gentiles started to believe in Christ, and it's the, the same is true today. Mostly Gentiles today believe in Christ. Very few Jews do. Some Jews do. Some Arabs even do. Some Muslims do. And there are some in every race that believe in Christ, but mainly it's Gentiles. What is a Gentile? A Gentile is someone who does not have Jewish blood in them. I don't have Jewish blood in me, and, and I don't know if you do or not. And I don't think my wife does, but it's, uh, it's hard to tell because uh, a Jewish blood, if you just have one-tenth of a percent of Jewish blood in you, you are Jewish. And that's the way it works. But uh, for the most part, around this area, none of us have Jewish blood. And you must understand there is a difference between Judaism. You can be a Jew, call yourself a Jew, and follow Judaism, the religion. And there are Gentiles who follow the religion of Judaism. But uh, you can be born into the race of the Jews, meaning that you have come from uh, Abraham, which means you are part of the Jewish race. It doesn't mean you're better or anything like that. But as a Jew, you can still believe in Christ. And when all of us believe in Christ, we lose all of those racial matters anyway. We simply become royal family of God. And then, in uh, well, in chapter 5, verse 1, we see the platform of the king. And we will wrap up with uh, 5, 1 and 5, 2. Having seen the crowds, he went up the mountain. And a mountain is a place of solitude. I don't know how many of you like to go into the mountains. I do. And even when there's people around, a mountain can be a wonderful place of solitude in which you enjoy the scenery and all of that. So he went up into a mountain. That is, Jesus Christ did. And he went up there for a place of privacy where he could teach his disciples how to handle these large crowds. You see, this is uh, uh, Jesus Christ starting his ministry. He starts to uh, do all of these miracles, perform all of the, these miracles, and the crowds just come out of everywhere, coming from faraway lands. So there are thousands and thousands of people around the Lord. And the disciples didn't know how to handle it because this hadn't happened before. And so Jesus has to go up into a mountain with them for a little privacy to get away from all the hustle and bustle and teach them how to handle these large crowds and to teach them what to say to these large crowds when they would ask questions such as what did our Lord mean about this and what did our Lord mean about that since they were the disciples well they would have to help out in that because of such the large crowds so he had to teach them something so that they would know what to say after he sat down this means he was relaxed there never really was a time when our Lord wasn't Relaxed. He had a relaxed mental attitude. Now, when he was on the cross, you probably can't say that he was a relaxed as he is now, but he was happy. Now, but this has to do with the fact he had a relaxed mental attitude. After he sat down and was relaxed, his disciples came to him. 
Then he opened his mouth, that is Jesus Christ, opened his mouth and continually taught them by repeating these things. Now, I don't know what your translation says, but this is the corrected translation. And our Lord repeated these things to the disciples so that it would get through their thick skulls and they would remember these things. So he began to teach the disciples doctrine concerning the age of Israel and their spiritual life. Remember, we're still in the age of Israel. Actually, we're in the hypostatic union. But uh, this is all focused on the Israelites. So he wanted to show them uh, what their spiritual life was all about as being members of Israel. And along with the one that will be established in the millennium. That is along with the spiritual life that will be established in the millennium. So he started teaching them what their spiritual life should be right then and right there, and also how it should be in the millennium. You see, the Lord is still teaching as if the millennium is about to occur. He had to because he had to offer it first. He had to offer to the Jews the millennium. He had to say, the kingdom of heaven, of heaven is at hand. Believe in me. I will be your king and will reign over you for a thousand years. So he had to offer that to them in order for them uh, to be without excuse. If he hadn't offered it to them, they would say, well, we didn't know that the kingdom could have come now. But Christ made it very clear. The kingdom, your kingdom, the kingdom of Israel that will reign for a thousand years in which I will be your king can come right now if you believe in me. But they rejected that. But he had to offer it and we have to keep that in mind because when we make application for this age, when we read the Beatitudes and Matthew chapter 5, that's what they're called. When we read those, we have to always keep in mind that these Beatitudes are designed for the Jews and they're designed for the Jews in the millennium. Now there's application we can take out of these things. But our spiritual life is far greater than what is even our Lord talking about because our Lord is telling them how it's going to be in the millennium, how they should function when the kingdom comes. This is actually not for us. When you read the Beatitudes 5.3 and on where it says uh, blessed be, etc., etc., this is actually for the Jews only. Now we can take application from it and we will tomorrow night. We'll take application from all of these things and there is some application we can take for it, from it. But we w must always remember that what we have today are the mystery doctrines. And at this time when our Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, was teaching, these mystery doctrines were, were still hidden. The Lord Jesus Christ did not teach the mystery doctrines. He left that for the apostles. He didn't teach it. He was teaching the doctrines of the millennium. So this, while we can make application for ourselves, it's not really for us. This is how people are to live in the millennium. And we must understand dispensations to understand that. And if you haven't, uh, if you don't know what dispensations are, there's a book on it. I would recommend you get it, especially for this study, because Matthew has a lot of things dealing with dispensations. And if you don't understand the dispensations and the fact that the Jews were given something different than we are, and the fact that in the future when the millennium comes, they must live a different type of life, than we do because we have the mystery doctrines. And if you don't understand what that's all about, uh, you can get uh, dispensations. I believe it's a green book over there. And it will uh, fill you in on some of these things. And it would be important to read that before uh, you really get into Matthew. Otherwise, you'll just be confused and not know and think, well, I, was, I always thought Jesus was talking directly to me. In some cases, he is, especially in John. But in this case, uh, Matthew's writing to the Jews. And we, almost, we always must keep clear who the audience is. And when someone writes a book, they always have an audience. Uh, for example, uh, mechanics will write a book to mechanics uh, concerning a car or a vehicle and how to fix it. Now, I would uh, pick up a book on mechanics and not understand the thing it was talking about, yet a mechanic would understand. And so he's writing it to the Jews, and we must understand that. 
So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of your word. May we come to understand the importance of following Jesus Christ, the importance of following Jesus Christ by taking up our cross, which is to take up the spiritual life and to live it and to follow in his footsteps in order to glorify you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. 